Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good night, wherever you may be. My name is Gordon Flake. I'm the CEO of the Perth US Asia Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to a joint Perth US Asia Center Chicago Council on Global Affairs uh, event or report launch on a remarkable report put out by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, preventing nuclear proliferation and reassuring America's allies. Um, before we begin, let me acknowledge that it is the tradition of the Perth US Asia Center uh, and the University of Western Australia where we are situated. Today I'm actually virtual but here on campus at the same time to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. In this case, the Noongar people of the Wajak Nation. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we are very delighted to collaborate today in the launch of this report by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and particularly delighted to to hear from the, the president of the Chicago Council, Evo Dalder. Uh, in May of 2019, uh, we were honored to participate in a small kind of planning workshop as part of this effort that Evo had organized in Hawaii. Number one, because of Hawaii. Uh, and number two, because it was a great center point for allies of the United States in the region from Korea, from Japan, from Australia to meet together with key thinkers from the United States to think about extended deterrence, to think about uh, the American nuclear umbrella, to think about the credibility of that in this era. And I'm really pleased to see that Evo and his colleagues have gone on and taken that initial effort and that feedback and produced a really remarkable report uh, and so, some great recommendations that we're going to be discussing today. To, what we're going to do today is we're going to hear initially from Evo, and I think he needs no introduction. I think you saw in the, the invites you sent out, Evo, in addition to currently being president of the of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, was previously U.S. Ambassador to NATO, and has a long list of government and academic appointments, which I'm not going to go through today. And I'll do the same for the rest of our panelists. Uh, after some initial remarks from Evo, we're going to turn to some quick reactions from panelists here in Australia and also in the United States. We're delighted to be joined by uh, Amanda Gorley, who's currently the, the Assistant Secretary, or the First Assistant Secretary for Arms Control in our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Most recently, prior to that, she was Australia's ambassador to the Philippines, but a long distinguished career in government. Uh, we'll be hearing from Corey Shockey. I think Corey needs no introduction. She's vice president of the American Enterprise Institute and director of their foreign affairs uh, and defense policy group there. Uh, previously deputy director general of the IISS. When it gets close to June, we all think about the Shangri-La dialogue in this region and Corey's key role in that for so many years. But most recently in government uh, was director of policy planning at the State Department. And then last but not least, our own colleague here in Perth, not in the same office, but down the road, uh, Stephen Smith, who's a professor, the, the member of the board of directors of the Perth US Asia Center, but also chairman of the Defense and Security Institute here on campus at the University of Western Australia, and uh, previously foreign minister and defense minister. So we've got a wonderful panel, a wonderful chance to kind of take a step back and not focus on day-to-day -day issues, but longer term issues in both arms control and national security, the impact not just the United States, but of its networks and allies in the region. So Evo, thank you for this effort, the ability to collaborate and for, for getting up in the evening to kind of uh, to, to share your, your insights with us here. I'll turn the time over to you for initial kind of outline of your report and its conclusions, noting that everybody on the call has been sent a link to the report and hopefully they've had a chance to review it and we'll have some questions in the chat section later. So over to you, Evo. Well, Gordon, uh, thanks so much for, uh, for hosting us and, and uh, doing this together, not only now, but uh, the last time uh, when we met uh, in person in, in Hawaii, uh, not a bad place to have a conference, I can tell you. Uh, and it's great to see uh, uh, old, old friends uh, from, uh, from around the world uh, as well. So uh, wonderful to be here. Let me just be brief because the report itself is brief uh, and, and an easy read. Um, to talk a little bit uh, first of, of, of why we did this report, and then second, some of the highlights uh, with a particular emphasis on, on, on Asia and Asian allies, uh, which presumably is, is the most important for uh, our audience here. Um, going back uh, four or five years already during the campaign that President, uh, the D then Donald Trump ran, and of course, when he was elected, the question of America's security guarantee to allies was raised in a, in a whole variety of different ways. And one of the things that it struck us was we may have forgotten how important the security guarantee 
uh, uh, in general, and the nuclear guarantee in particular to allies has been over the years to uh, bolster America's nonproliferation policy. Go back to the 1950s and early 1960s. The thinking was that any country that could acquire nuclear weapons would acquire nuclear weapons. And that in particular, those countries uh, that were the most advanced economically and industrially would do so, many of which were American allies. And indeed, uh, the, second, the third country to, to acquire nuclear weapons was Great Britain, uh, uh, and, and the fourth was, uh, was France, two American allies. And the fear or the concern uh, in the early 1960s was what we would then call the nth country problem, who would be next? And we were concerned in the United States about many of our allies, Germany and Japan and others acquiring nuclear weapons uh, and decided that that was not a good idea. And the one way to address that was to negotiate with the Soviet Union and with other countries the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So in 1968, uh, we agreed to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which divided the world between those who had nuclear weapons, the five nuclear weapon powers recognized as such, and those who didn't, uh, and to maintain that status quo. Uh, but secondly, uh, the United States spent a lot of time convincing its allies that it would take care of their security, including their nuclear security. And it was that guarantee uh, that convinced countries like Germany, uh, like Japan, to sign on to the NPT. Uh, you know, when the Cold War ended, we all forgot about all of this stuff. Uh, but when security alliances were again called into the question, and when the security environment facing our allies was changing with the rise in China and nuclear uh, North Korea, a, a much more aggressive and assertive uh, Russia, the question of America's security guarantee and the nuclear dimension thereof would again come to the fore. And if a country uh, that had long relied on the US nuclear guarantee decided that it could no longer do so, what were its options? Well, one of them was to acquire nuclear weapons. So the question we asked is what can the US do? What can allies do to manage this proliferation concern? So particularly the proliferation concern of allies uh, thinking that they uh, can no longer rely on the United States. And we pulled together a, a task force uh, of former uh, officials chaired by Chuck Hagel, former Secretary of Defense, uh, Malcolm Rifkin, former Secretary of Defense, uh, and Defense uh, Secretary and Foreign Secretary in the UK, and uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, former Prime Minister and Foreign Minister in Australia, uh, with a host of European, American, and Asian uh, former officials, military uh, and, uh, and civilian uh, alike, to have a discussion uh, and to pull together some, uh, some thoughts about what we might be able to do. That was the task force, the report that, uh, that uh, you have seen, hopefully read, uh, uh, sort of laid out uh, our recommendations. And let me focus, if, if I may, sort of on three big ones. Uh, uh, but I'm happy to, of course, uh, move it in, in, in a larger direction, but just in three big ones. First, we argued that it was vital for the United States to uh, reaffirm the fundamental security guarantees and uh, alliance structures and the nuclear guarantee that had been essential to alliance relations. Uh, easier uh, when uh, Joe Biden uh, won the election than would have been the case if Donald Trump had been reelected. But even with Biden uh, re uh, elected, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, automatic. Uh, it is, the reaffirmation required a, it requires a continuing dialogue with allies about these kinds of issues. And in particular, it requires a dialogue that the US really hasn't had with its allies for the last 20, 30 years on nuclear weapons issues. To bring uh, allies more into the nuclear planning process to make allied views and concerns uh, more central in how the United States thinks about its nuclear weapons, thinks about its, arms, its, uh, um, its modernization programs, and thinks about arms control uh, negotiations. And to do that in a much more integrated, consultative way than uh, it has done for many years, or in some ways has ever done. So that was uh, uh, proposal number one. Proposal number two, with a particular focus on Asia, was to make sure 
that the United States had this dialogue with its main Asian allies, and by that it meant South Korea, Japan, and Australia. Uh, and uh, to have that nuclear dialogue, which is very quiet in the U.S., in the bilateral relationship with, with, uh, between the U.S. and its Asian allies, uh, elevated in some ways. Uh, we were uh, concerned that uh, the kind of debates about whether or not to acquire nuclear weapons uh, that used to be in, in very quiet corners in some allied uh, countries are uh, merging now in, uh, in more openly, particularly in a country like South Korea, uh, but also in other places, and that there needed to be a real dialogue uh, among the U.S. and its Asian allies, and perhaps to do so not just bilaterally, but multilaterally. So we proposed uh, specifically the creation of an Asian nuclear planning group a group in which the three Asian allies of the United States and the United States could have discussions about nuclear weapons issues, in part so that some allies could ask questions that other allies wanted to answer but didn't necessarily want to ask. Uh, and here I'm, uh, we were thinking about uh, sensitivities that uh, Japan, for example, has or others. So that was uh, a major uh, issue that we thought was important too, sort of multilateralizing the the nuclear dimension of, uh, of the alliance. And then finally, uh, it was important to rethink the arms control. We think it's important to rethink the arms control um, effort. Uh, yes, to extend New START, which already happened, uh, uh, then followed on by another uh, post New START uh, negotiation between Russia and the United States, but ultimately to find a way to bring particularly the Chinese into a discussion on nuclear weapons issues uh, and uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to do that. Uh, our suggestion was to use the P5 framework that because the five countries are members, uh, are the permanent members of the Security Council, because they are the five recognized nuclear powers uh, under the MPT, that having a dialogue at a higher and more intense level than it currently is taking place, first of all, on issues of doctrine and offense and defense uh, and strategic stability, then on issues of how do you uh, open up and be more transparent about your capabilities uh, and notifications of missile launches and tests, testing, uh, et cetera. And then ultimately perhaps some form of multilateral arms control limitations uh, of the five nuclear powers. Uh, but really to find a way to bring China into it without trying to, uh, which the Trump administration tried to do basically say China should be treated in the same way as the United States and Russia when it comes to nuclear weapons, um, uh, given the disparity in numbers uh, still existing, that was just not gonna work. Finding a different way to do that. So that's, that was really the, the core of the argument. It's about how do we maintain nuclear security uh, in an age of, of growing questions about the credibility of alliances uh, without promoting more countries getting nuclear weapons. Well, thank you, Ivo. Um, in the spectrum of issues that foreign policy think tanks work on, a lot of them are of high importance, but high public salience. You know, the public is interested and they care about them. I mean, we've all, despite our own lack of expertise, had to talk about COVID and how it's impacted us. We focus on foreign interference and a whole range of issues. This seems to be one of those issues that is extremely high on the importance level, but very low on the, on the public awareness and the public salience issue. And so I'm really happy to see Chicago Council kind of lead on a discussion which hasn't gotten nearly enough attention. And I might get some agreement from that from Australia's ambassador for arms control and counterproliferation. Amanda, you're kind of a, a target of this report uh, as an American ally working specifically in this space. Let's kind of start off with your reaction, both to Evo's comments uh, and the report itself from, from a perspective in Australia. Thanks very much, Gordon. And thanks very much, Evo, for uh, outlining the, um, your key recommendations, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, I have to say, I um, read the report when it first came out, and then I reread it earlier this week in preparation for this um, um, panel, and I was struck by the um, fact that it has almost provided a bit of a blueprint for the Biden administration with some of the suggestions uh, there, particularly in the European uh, arena, having already, already been taken up quite um, actively by the Biden administration, but even in the Asian um, 
arena as well with, um, you know, for instance, uh, the National Security Advisor hosting talks with his Japanese and Korean counterparts just recently. So I congratulate um, Evo and the team who worked on the report for putting forward some really um, practical and interesting ideas on this issue and for generating um, some uh, dialogue and debate. And I agree with you, Gordon, these issues, you know, I compare it to climate change, for instance, where, you know, President Biden had the uh, big summit in April and, you know, the, the sort of momentum that that generates. Um, and, you know, if we had that sort of focus in the, the arms control space, I wonder what, what could be achieved. And it's my, my personal opinion that we won't um, see significant progress um, in bringing in China, for instance, until we have the sort of leader level uh, focus and commitment that we had in the lead up to start and new start negotiations. Um, having said that, um, I completely uh, agree with um, the report's uh, priority that it puts on the alliance relationships and the security guarantees and the contribution that those security guarantees make to um, non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and non-acquisition of nuclear weapons by a whole range of countries. And just while I have the floor, I should underline that Australia is not contemplating the uh, acquisition of nuclear weapons. Um, and we have a long-standing uh, commitment on both sides of government not, not to do that. Um, but I think, um, you know, the Biden administration has been pretty quick out of the blocks to reassure allies of its commitment. I think Australia, um, you know, probably was in a better spot than some others around um, alliance commitments under the Trump administration. Um, but I have, I would have to say, you know, having spent three years in the Philippines from 2016 to 2019, that really underlined for me uh, how important to some countries are, uh, or to all alliance partners, but um, countries like the Philippines sort of in a very um, uh, strategic situation, how important those guarantees are. And to be frank, uh, that preceded the Trump administration, uh, you know, some of the uncertainties that the Philippines might have had around uh, US commitment. So it's very good to see uh, renewed commitment to the alliances in a very, um, uh, you know, public way as well. Um, we, we are certainly interested in the ideas in the paper around, um, you know, bringing more focus within this region on um, the risks and the threats of uh, nuclear um, proliferation. And um, we would certainly like to see more work done on um, increasing awareness. We co-hosted last year with uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum, or as part of the ASEAN Regional Forum, um, a meeting on risk reduction where, you know, the intention was to raise more awareness, but there's certainly a lot of scope for more work to be done. Um, I also... Um, I'm attracted to the recommendations in the report around what comes after New START and how do we bring in um, other nuclear weapons states to a new arms control arrangement. I'm pleased with the uh, focus that has been put on um, the multilateral arms control framework, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and the fact that that treaty has uh, provided the environment for uh, you know considerable disarmament over its lifetime. Um, we can we need to continue to reinforce the, the uh, strength and the normative value and the article six commitments to disarmament that are in the nuclear non-proliferation treaty because there are you know various uh threats to undermine that regime that we cannot and should not ignore um so on the whole i um look forward to this discussion i did have one minor um well it's not minor but one um complaint about the report evo and that is that there were no uh in terms of gender balance there were no females involved in the uh in the uh, production of the report, at least not listed in the um, uh, the task force co-chairs and the task force members. And I do think, um, you know, more broadly, bringing um, a better gender balance to these issues is also a very important thing and also a priority of the Australian government. Thanks. 
Well, it, it may seem that uh, we have asked Corey to join this panel because she's like some cautionary post-apocalyptic tale <laughs> sitting in the mountains on candlelight about what happens if we don't follow the recommendations of the report. But really, um, because of your experience in London, uh, the deep involvement with the Shangri-La Dialogue over the years, uh, and now bringing a Washington DC perspective, we'd welcome your reaction uh, to, to the report from Washington as opposed to Chicago or Canberra or Perth here. So. so I think the report is outstanding. I think it's really important. I think its two main recommendations are both creative and practical. Um, I, I think I might emphasize even more than the report does the urgency of finding ways to, to multilateralize our conversation about extended deterrence with our Asian allies. If you look at the proportion of South Koreans who favor acquisition of their own national nuclear weapons, um, I, I do think the status quo of non-proliferation in Asia is extraordinarily tenuous. Mm. And as the report makes clear, the best non-proliferation tool we uh, free societies have is alliance security guarantees. And not just American guarantees, but allies guarantees to each other. And the difficulty, in particular, the difficulty of the relationship between Japan and South Korea, I actually think is very much uh, attenuated by Australia's involvement in the conversations. Mm -hmm. I noticed when I was the deputy for policy planning in the State Department, we had trilateral conversations with our Japanese and South Korean counterparts. And it's really hard uh, to get a constructive conversation going and actually adding a fourth point, turning it from a triangle into a square and possibly even someday into a Pentagon with Indian participation um, will actually help South Korea and Japan to have a constructive relationship with each other. Moreover, transparency among the allies with security commitments to each other uh, is stabilizing in and of itself. So I really, I'm kicking myself that I as an old NATO hand wasn't smart enough to come up with uh, the commission or the report's suggestion for a nuclear planning group. But my experience with it in a NATO context suggests just how reassuring it is for allies to have a conversation with the United States where other allies are also invo involved. The transparency of those conversations is extraordinarily stabilizing in a European context. And I believe while there are not many ways in which a European example is applicable in Asia, I do think the stabilization of transparency is one that, uh, that would transport to the Pacific. <coughs> the second major suggestion of the report that I think is really important is trying to hold uh, quintipartite uh, nuclear arms reduction talks among the UN P5. Um, it's a way to include China into the conversation of major nuclear powers, but it includes them in a way that has um, countries with similarly sized nuclear forces or much more similar than the US and Russian uh, nuclear arsenals. And that may create opportunities for creative arms control that a bilateral or a trilateral um, negotiating framework would not. And putting it in a UN context will also underscore the NPT responsibilities of those five countries and could prove quite reassuring to the countries who justifiably believe the P5 have an 
met the entirety of their commitments under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So I think that's a really constructive idea uh, and one that I very much hope my government takes up uh, in, a, in a proactive way. Uh, I think these, the, we too often think of the security situation in Asia as a, the problem the United States has with a rising China. And it's very much in China's interest to frame this bilaterally. And it's very much not just in America's interest, but in the interest of America's Asian allies to remind everybody all of the time that they are both an emboldening and a restraining force on the United States. Um, and in many contexts, that's valuable not just to America's friends, but also to America's adversaries. And so empowering Australia, Japan, and South Korea in particular um, as deeply trusted and deeply invested American allies, I think creates more power centers in the security situation or reinforces more power centers in the security situation in Asia in a way that I think is very good for all of our interests. The last thing I will say is two questions I'd love to ask Evo about if uh, you can fit them into the queue, Gareth. One is um, India is notably absent from your architecture. How do you see India's role playing in this as an Asian nuclear power? And the second, um, how uh, are you as worried about the many ways that North Korea can um, behave badly in ways that destabilize the balance in Asia? Well, thank you so much, Corey. We're going we're gonna to come back to Evo can, to give him a chance to can react after the initial panel responses. Um, uh, but before we do that, we want to go to, to Professor Stephen Smith. Stephen, as a, as a former minister, not only did you have to deal with these issues directly during your time in, in government, but you're also familiar with being in a position receiving a report like this from, from, from academia, from the foreign policy community, uh, and, and being the recipient of efforts to raise the profile of issues such as we're dealing with today. So in that context, your reaction to, to the conversation thus far, Evo's remarks in the report would be deeply appreciated. Well, thanks very much, Gordon, and uh, Evo, congratulations. It's a very good report. And from that perspective, Gordon, of you're a minister or you're the governor and you receive something from a university or a think tank or a, or a commission, the first thing you look for as a minister is, is what do they actually want me to do? Where are the practical suggestions that I can actually take off in bite sizes and actually progress this and move it forward? And I think both Amanda and Corey have commented upon, you know, there's, 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 it's, 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 a, it's a short report, uh, but the recommendations are practical, they're easy to seek to effect. And so from a perspective of a government, it's a good report to receive because there's a range of practical initiatives that you can take, which will advance the, advance the interests. Um, just stepping back a bit, a, a, a number of things. Firstly, in terms of um, concern or awareness or expectation about this particular issue, in the Australian context, Amanda is probably the only person in Australia who wakes up every day thinking about nuclear issues, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. And so as a general proposition, um, it's not something which is front of mind uh, in Australia. Uh, and uh, whilst we have, in my own view, a very good track record of pursuing these issues, uh, and for example, um, when Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister, Kevin, of course, together with Chuck, one of the, one of the um, uh, 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 trustees in the sense of this, of this report, we initiated with Japan a report on nuclear non-proliferation uh, and incrementally move that, uh, that forward. So apart from perhaps Gareth Evans, Amanda's the only person who's doing it on a daily basis. And so there is a job about expectation and awareness. Secondly, I think the fundamental starting point is um, whilst we all breathed a sigh of relief when the Trump administration finished after one term, uh, I think we just need to, to be conscious that it will take more than the, the departure of Trump and the arrival of Biden to reinstill into 
the allies and partners in the US will and spoke post-World War II arrangement, that things have returned to normal. And so I think this particularly applies in Southeast Asia, which doesn't get a mention in, in the report for, for the obvious sort of nuclear proliferation reason. But um, I think the starting point has to be making sure that the Biden administration understands and continues on a daily basis to reinstill confidence in the US as a security provider generally, as well as in terms of uh, a nuclear umbrella. So uh, there are two general points. Uh, in addition to being a valuable tool for a government, what the report, of course, does is it raises awareness of the issue and gets us thinking. Uh, and I, I thought um, one of the things that attracted me to the report was uh, uh, some of the comments that Corey made and expanded upon, which is, if, if you look, for example, let's just take uh, the Korean Peninsula, and if there's going to be a nuclear issue or impetus to try and address or solve a nuclear issue, on the balance of probability, it's more likely to be the peninsula which will which will start first. So an easy thing to do would be to slip straight back to um, the the group of six, uh, the, the, the six the six party talks. Um, now they were long, painstaking, and ultimately achieved not a great deal. So maybe in that context, instead of just reverting to the six party talks, we could say, well, maybe the addition of smaller powers who have an interest in this uh, might be a, a, a helpful contribution. So Australia, for example, could play a role in that. Uh, and so the notion of trilateralizing, looking at uh, how the Quad might play a role, looking at how we can draw um, South Korea, the Republic of Korea into these conversations, what responsibility or role can Australia play I think uh, Corey has made a very good point, which is um, one of the reasons that we all now talk about the Indo-Pacific, uh, not just uh, ASEAN, but Australia, the United States, uh, India, Indonesia. Uh, now the Europeans have all got an, an Indo-Pacific strategy or approach. One of the reasons we do that is, is that you wouldn't have an Indo-Pacific without a rising India. So we do need to think about how can we engage India in this conversation uh, as well. Um, the notion of, in terms of UN multilateral effort, of engaging the P5, I think that's a very good device to try and start a conversation with China, because given the current US-China relationship, uh, the Australia-China relationship, and China's relationship with a whole range of other countries, I think it's going to take a while before you get China into a conversation about the substance of these issues. So using the P5 with the non-proliferation treaty obligations, the Security Council, the UN, I think that's a very good mechanism to try that, 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 uh, that, that, that broader and more general approach, particularly in terms of enticing China into a conversation. But uh, overall, Gordon, I think it's a, it's a first class contribution, which you'd expect from Evo and for, and for uh, people like uh, Chuck and Kevin Rudd associated with it. And I think it's a, it's a good vehicle for us to both create awareness, uh, not just public awareness, but awareness within governments that whilst this issue doesn't get as much prominence as it has in the past, it can very easily tripwire into the most uh, difficult issue that we have to deal with. So it's a very good report and we should all, all put our shoulder to the wheel to progress it and move it forward. Well, thank you, Stephen. Uh, let me note that we've got live with us today uh, participants from all around the world, which is really the advantage of this format. A number from Europe, a large group of participants from, from India, from Japan, from South Korea, even someone from the Intermountain West. I'll give a shout out to a former professor of mine, Eric Heyer. Thank you for joining us from, from the, uh, the US at this point. Um, we have a chat function. We've got about 30 minutes left. If you have specific questions, feel free to put them in the chat uh, and I'll try to get to them as best we can. I've also got a long list of, of questions that were sparked by the report and by the wonderful panel's comments. But before we go to that, I'd like to go back to you, Eva. There's a couple of specific questions that were thrown to you, uh, and you might want to have some other reactions to the remarks for the panelists as well. So back to you, if we could. Well, I appreciate that, and, and really appreciate all the, uh, all the comments, great comments. Uh, 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 to Steve's last point, I think part of what we are trying to do is exactly what you, what you emphasize. It's, it's bringing awareness to an issue that people generally don't think about. And yet, if this goes wrong, it can go terribly wrong in a very quick way. Uh, uh, and we don't have to spell out how to, I think we can all figure that out ourselves. And, and that was, if we achieve that, we have achieved a lot uh, off the report. 
Uh, to some of the specifics, Amanda, you're totally right. And, and uh, on, on the, the gender, in, it, well, there's no gender imbalance. There is no balance. Mm. There's nothing uh, of the sort. Part of it is uh, a, a number of folks who had signed up to, uh, to be part of it uh, could no longer because of new obligations that they had taken on. And part of it is um, a, a failure uh, to, to just go out and find the right people uh, to make that happen. Um, and then part of it is we wanted foreign, former ministers. And uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, so in the Asian countries, uh, particularly in Japan and Korea, that became hard. Uh, but even in the European countries, it's not the, the easiest thing. That said, uh, uh, the criticism is, is, is right on the money and, uh, and deservedly so. Um, on, on Corey's points on India and, and, um, uh, uh, and North Korea, the two questions, on India, our focus was allies, which made it very easy not to talk about a whole bunch of other people we should talk about. Clearly, India is, needs to be part of this entire conversation, both when you come to the arms control question uh, and, and, of course, the Indo-Pacific question. We do make the, the recommendation that the Quad should consider um, um, uh, opening up potentially to a role of, of South Korea should uh, Seoul be interested in that? So we, we have that piece uh, in, the, in the report. Um, uh, but the focus was really about what can the US and its allies do uh, to manage uh, this particular uh, conversation. Uh, on, on, on North Korea, I mean, it is, it is deeply, you know, it's not a surprise that South Korea, there is a live debate about whether or not to acquire nuclear weapons because at the very moment that the North Koreans acquired the capacity to deliver a nuclear weapon against the United States territory, and therefore, by definition, called into question the credibility of America's nuclear guarantee to South Korea, we also uh, had a president who denigrated that alliance in every single way that he possibly could. And so uh, I think if you want a test case, of where managing alliance relationships or failing to manage alliance relationships in the right way uh, and the consequences that may come from that, South Korea, North Korea is it. And, and uh, you know, it's not surprising that my South Korean participants in the task force were very much focused on North Korea. Uh, for them, that was the issue, not China. Uh, whereas for others, it was China. Uh, and, and so, addressing the North Korea issue is, is absolutely critical, but the foundation will have to be a very strong security alliance uh, between the United States and its allies. And then my final point that I, I think is so important, and Corey, you touched on it, and Steve, you touched on it, and, and Amanda too. It's the role of, uh, of allies that they can play, that uh, uh, the, let's call them the middle powers, uh, and Australia in particular, to, to, you know, the reason I like the MPG is because Australia can ask questions of the United States that others won't. Uh, and yet they want to know the answer, uh, right? Uh, about about where, you're, where weapons are deployed, what strategies you have for first use or, 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 or what have you. Uh, and, it's, and it's really important uh, to, to, um, to have those kinds of debates. And a country like Australia or, you know, in, 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 in uh, interestingly enough, in, um, in NATO, it's a country like Norway that plays that probing role and asks the questions that some others might not be able uh, or willing to ask uh, is so important. So that's why having dialogue that brings more people and voices in um, may, you know, has, has purposes that go beyond just having the dialogue uh, and to affect changes that otherwise would be difficult to, to manage. Fantastic. I have a lot of discussion points, but there's been a number of really good questions come up in the chat. And I'm going to go to a couple of those first, just because they're useful. Just as a response to the conversation we just had, uh, uh, Nobuyasu Abe from, from Japan said, certainly the report was on U.S. allies, but in the meantime, it may be useful to think about partners, which may include Taiwan and India now. Uh, just again, a reaffirmation of what we've just been discussing. But the question I want to go to immediately is from somebody I think is known to most of us, uh, Tanaka Nobuo, former president of the International Energy Agency, now president of the Saskatchewan Peace Foundation, writes, nuclear power has serious public acceptance issues. 
after the Fukushima accident to recover public support to join the nuclear weapon ban treaty is needed. Does that hurt U.S. extended deterrence? And so um, that's a little bit of a sensitive issue, but this whole I notion of a nuclear weapons ban treaty. Uh, Eva, can we go to you on that? So, you know, I'm on record as believing that uh, as the president I work for, that uh, we should strive towards the, the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. So I'm all in favor. Uh, and I think there are strategies that we need to think about. I don't think a treaty banning nuclear weapons gets you there. Uh, that, that is a statement of intent rather than a statement of uh, a strategy for, for, for getting it there. And I also believe that as long as nuclear weapons exist, uh, the alliance relationship that the United States has with its allies will have a nuclear dimension and must have a nuclear dimension. And so uh, it, it is complicated for the United States for extended deterrence uh, if in alliance relationships, some allies uh, move to uh, sign on to the nuclear weapons ban treaty. This is a big issue in NATO where there are allies who wanna move in this direction. Uh, and of course, uh, it is potentially an issue in the issue with Japan. So I think uh, it would be more fruitful to think about other ways in which we can try to do the two things we wanna do. Uh, one is to talk about the role of nuclear power and nuclear weapons and what that and, and nuclear power uh, and, and what that means. And secondly, to put an emphasis on, on arms control and disarmament. And, and, and one of the reasons we, you know, one of the big four recommendations we put in here was arms control was we understand that for non-nuclear countries to feel more comfortable with being under the U.S. nuclear umbrella, having an active approach in arms control is absolutely critical for public reasons, but also just for, for uh, the reasons that many of these countries want to get to a world in which there are no longer nuclear weapons. And therefore, it's important for uh, the U.S. To, to maintain that. But I think that's different than uh, the nuclear ban treaty, which is aspirationally nice, um, but strategically uh, not sure that that gets us to, uh, closer to where we want to be. Thank you. And I, I'm sure other panelists have comments on that, but I'd like to steer the, the conversation back to the kind of the report and the focus on alliances. Um, uh, Ivo, you mentioned that, that the reaffirmation of the U.S. leadership, the U.S. role in this front uh, was not automatic, despite the Biden re-election. It was good to hear some comments from Amanda that, that the Biden administration is kind of quick out of the blocks on this. And, and I, I actually pulled up because it struck me when, when President Biden um, gave his, his speech, um, I'm trying to figure the exact words uh, he used. He essentially said, um, um, you know, America is back, but our allies don't trust that we're back. And we have to not only prove that we're back, but we're back to stay. And we have to do that with allies. And that seems to echo for me the core re recommendation in your report, Evo, about dialogues on that front. But I'd like to go to our other panelists uh, initially. Maybe we'll go kind of reverse order, start with you, Stephen. Um, Obviously, we're just over 100 days, you know, 110 days since the, the inauguration of President Biden. Uh, the, you know, the Biden administration is fast out of the blocks. But as you indicated, there's a lot of damage done to U.S. credibility, uh, particularly, you know, not, not particularly, but even among allies in that regard. So could you give us a little bit of your assessment about uh, what is required in terms of U.S. reassurance in this space from your view? I think firstly, it, it, it's got to be um, uh, sending the message that uh, it's not just 100 days, but this is a return to the norm that we've seen essentially since the end of World War II. So I think progress on that front today has been good. I think it's been better in Northeast Asia and South Asia than in Southeast Asia. So I was uh, chatting to a, a group of um, US consular officials a month ago, and I asked a simple question, which is, we, we can all give, give, give the names of the senior officials who visited Japan, Republic of Korea, and India, but give us the name of the senior officials who visited Indonesia, and the answer is, we don't know, because no one senior has gone there yet. And so I think particularly, it's not, in a sense, relevant to this conversation, but I think the weakness is Southeast Asia, uh, and I think that needs to have some considerable attention. But so far, so good. I thought that... Um, Biden's approach to the first Quad leaders meeting reflected a notion that this was the US dealing with four, with, with, with three other like-minded uh, countries looking to the future on issues which concerned all. 
climate change and other things. So look, I think so far so good, but there's a long way to go. Um, we dodged a bullet not having a second Trump term. I think a second Trump term would have done potentially irreparable damage to confidence in the US as a long-term security provider. Uh, but look, so far so good, but um, 100 days does not make a term nor a long-term commitment. Uh, Corey, your, your view on this. Yeah, so I agree with what Stephen said. I also think, actually, weirdly, the willful destructiveness of Trump administration alliance policies have the, have the perverse effect of showing just how deep and strong those alliances are. Because, you know, the kinds of things the president was saying about stationing of U.S. troops in Japan and South Korea and the, de the demand for 350 percent increase in contributions by allies and all of the nasty stuff he would say, that there is still belief is actually a really beautiful sign about the depth and interwovenness of our, of our defense community. I agree that a second Trump term would have done perhaps irreparable damage to that. And I agree with Stephen's point that the Biden administration is doing lots of graceful things. There are two things I've not yet seen them do, though, that uh, I think would be helpful. The first is explain how a foreign policy for the middle class is different than Trump's America first because especially on trade policy, they sound kind of alike to me. And so I would like to hear from the administration that they are gonna commit to stabilizing uh, trade treaties, for example, with America's closest allies. I think that would be a useful signal. The second thing I would point out though, is those of you who have not yet read Evo's Chicago Council on Global Affairs polls of American public attitudes. You can take heart that the American public actually, you know, in 2016, the, the polling showed that Americans were, re President Trump's question about the value of America's alliances was really resonating with Americans. And what you saw in the subsequent four years was Americans seeing the effects of those policies and wanting very much to return to the kinds of relationships Stephen was talking about with America's closest friends and allies. And so it's not just the behavior of the president and an administration. America's allies should understand this, that there's the stabilizing factor of American public support for this, which is ultimately the test of the resilience and the depth of America's alliance relationships. Well, th thank you, Corey. I, I have to confess that during the last four years, uh, I took great solace in the Chicago Council on Global Affairs polls precisely because of that reason. And Stephen can attest that I was regularly citing them to, to say, <laughs> there is hope, there is hope. The public is in a different spot here. Amanda, it, it may be difficult for you to address the, the political elements of that, that question in terms of reassurance in the U.S. and the change between two administrations. But I'm kind of curious, looking at it from, from a government perspective, uh, what is it that, that you're looking for from the United States beyond what you call the being quick out of the blocks? Well, well thanks very much, Gordon. And I would just hark back to the, um, you mentioned uh, President Biden's statement that America is back, but he, he went further than that, I think, in the European context and said, you know, America will keep its faith with its Article 5 commitments. That is an unshakable vow and a guarantee. And I think, you know, that is a very uh, reassuring um, statement for the US President to make. Um, I think it's interesting to the, the report you know, makes it clear it's not just a one-way street with the US providing, you know, further reassurance. There are also obligations on the Allies as well to step up and uh, take responsibility, um, you know, for their own contribution to our collective defence. And um, I'd just point to the um, Australian Defence Strategic Update uh, last year, which, you know, reflected that um, willingness and 
intention on Australia's part. I'd also just say that, you know, the threats that we are facing as um, countries aligned with each other have evolved over the course of the last five years as well. And while we are talking about military alliances in, in uh, this context, um, you know, there are a whole range of new threats to um, and emerging threats to our security that uh, we also need to be uh, talking about. We are talking about, but uh, we certainly can't afford complacency on that front either. Well, thank you. Um, we're running quickly out of time, but I do want to go back to the issue of the other allies that were part of this report in this process, Japan and Korea. Corey, you made a remarkable comment uh, that the conversation with Japan and Korea, whether they're bilateral or trilateral in the United States, was attenuated by having Australia be part of that. Evo, that was certainly my observation from our efforts in, in, in Hawaii, that having Australia part of that conversation took it up to a different level, more of a conceptual level. But I'm kind of curious... If, if, if we could go back to that particular question, uh, we we're focusing heavily on next steps in Washington, D.C. What do you think are the next steps in, in Tokyo or Seoul uh, or next steps for Australia in working together with the U.S. In, in, in engaging Korea and Japan on these issues as allies? We'll start with you, Eva, then maybe to Corey, uh, Amanda, then Stephen. So uh, let me fold in also a little bit of what I think the United States needs to do more than it has done. Uh, and I agree with, with the sentiment that has been expressed that it's good to have an administration who, who talks the language of alliances and cares about it in, in, in the right way. I do think that our alliances need to evolve. They've long had to evolve. Uh, one way is, is for uh, uh, allies to take on more responsibility uh, and doing more uh, as part of that. And, and I think the man, as you rightly pointed out, the Australian uh, defense paper from last year was update was, was, was extremely useful in, in that perspective. I think our European allies need to do a little more uh, on those kinds of issues and perhaps follow uh, in the footsteps of, of the UK's new uh, defense guidance, at least in some respects. Um, but it also means that the United States needs to change. And I, and if I, have sort of one suggestion to the administration, you can't uh, approach alliances in the way you used to, which is basically to say, we will decide, we'll tell you about it, uh, which we will call consultation, and then you just follow. And I'll take the Afghanistan decision, uh, which is of course very relevant, uh, not just for our European friends, but uh, for, uh, for Australia and indeed New Zealand, uh, who have been uh, with the United States from, uh, from day one, I mean, literally day one, uh, when it comes to Afghanistan uh, until uh, this very day. And the idea that somehow a, a, a decision on an operation, which two thirds of the total number of troops in country are not American, uh, uh, is taken by uh, basically flying over to, to NATO and not even other countries and telling them this is what we have decided and sign up isn't exactly where we need to be. That uh, you want to have, I think, a much more uh, uh, consultative uh, process rather than an informing process of leadership and be willing to change your mind as a result uh, and, and to share more uh, as part of that. I think we missed an opportunity in Afghanistan there. I, you know, I don't have a problem with the decision, but it is a decision we should have all arrived at at the same time, not the U.S. saying, this is what we're doing. The allies say, well, if you're leaving, we're not staying. After all, we're here because of you, uh, which I think that would be nice if that were acknowledged a little more. Uh, it was because of the U.S. was attacked, not because Australia was attacked, or Germany was attacked, or Italy was attacked. So Thinking through how to change our alliance operations, I think, is uh, necessary, uh, and that. But it also puts the the monkey back on allied, on the allies to say, okay, we'll have to do more, uh, and uh, as we take more responsibility. Okay. Any uh, quick other reactions from from Corey, Stephen, or Amanda on that one? Well, I was just going to um, 
mentioned the Biden administration is um, carrying out its nuclear posture review and, you know, how it will be important as part of that process for allies, um, including Australia, to be consulted on, on, um, on that document um, with, you know, and have the ability to put in our perspectives. Um, I mean, I think that would be a useful first step um, in terms of um, being able to reflect some of the potential consequences of um, different policy options um, and different policy settings that might be available to the Biden administration. Thanks. Fantastic. Corey, good to you. Yeah, I was just going to add to Eva's point that setting allies up to be successful in the way that I think the U.S.-Australian relationship worked during Australia's leadership of the U.N. intervention in East Timor is a good model for the U.S. quietly setting an ally up to be successful. And that's an important part of reassurance as well. Thanks. Stephen? I was just going to make the general comment. I think of all of the US allies, Australia probably was least troubled by the four years of Trump. I'm sure, there was the famous Trump uh, Prime Minister Turnbull phone mm. call. But the response to that was every other aspect of United States engagement with the Australian alliance was positive and constructive and wanted uh, to minimise the damage. And so the approach Australia took after that was essentially keep our heads down, don't stick your head above the trench, but the day-to-day -day operational aspects of the alliance will continue. So I think we're, we're in a much better confidence position, if I can put it that way, than, for example, South Korea and Japan, who I thought were probably in the firing line uh, in the most egregious way. So, and that, I think, gives, us, gives Australia both the opportunity and the obligation to say, OK, we're less... We're less um, uh, um, charred by this experience or chastened by this experience, how can we help? And I do think the notion of, of saying, let's just not do the bilateral thing, let's trilateralise it, let's multilateralise it or minilateralise it, but the more people in the room who are like-minded can help. And so, which was what, go back to my earlier comment about a, a straightforward return to the six party talks on the Korean Peninsula may not get anywhere, but involving other countries who can make a fresh contribution to that might be something which is of assistance. And so in terms of Australia having to step up, I think it's in that sort of area where Australia can and should step up to help trilateralise a conversation or extend the quad to acquaint with the inclusion of South Korea and the like. Uh, thanks. If I can interject just a tiny bit here, those of you who know I spent 25 years in Washington working primarily on Northeast Asia, Korea, Japan. And in that context, my view of US alliance relationships, including extended deterrence and non-proliferation was Korea versus Japan. Uh, and I understood their existence of the five eyes, but I really thought it was more language, culture, common heritage type of thing. I didn't really understand uh, the depth of the, the five eyes relationship, the legal underpinning of it, the intelligence gathering analysis kind of thing that means that there's a level of intimacy that, which I just didn't understand until I moved to Australia. And to bring that to this conversation here, I think this is why Australia has such an important role to play in conversations with Korea and Japan because of that level of understanding and intimacy that doesn't come necessarily just out of Washington, DC. So for example, you know, you know, on North Korea, one of my favorite talking points is to make it clear that the reason that Australia remains so deeply engaged on North Korea isn't just because North Korean missiles can now reach us is that our own national security strategy has largely depended on reliance on an alliance relationship with the United States and the nuclear umbrella or extended deterrence that Evo has been talking about here, but also on the rules-based order. Uh, here, I would note that Amanda's been working really hard to get an Australian candidate across the line as, as head of the Comprehensive Test Ban Organization, CP. Treaty, New Comprehensive Treaty. Nuclear <laughs> Test Ban <laughs> Treaty Organization. Thank you for plugging. But Australia has a lot vested in the rules-based order. And so my quick note is that while Australia obviously has the technological, scientific, economic capabilities to do both missiles and nuclear weapons, like Japan and Korea, it has made a decision not to, but instead to rely on what we've been talking about today, the Alliance for the United States and that rules-based order. So let me, we've already hit time. I do want to end up with one final question for Evo, just because I think it kind of gets to the, to wrap it up. 
uh, 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 Ramtin Sapaspur, who I think is in Canberra right now, used to be in the prime minister and cabinet's office there, asked, with nuclear issues not front of center in the minds of the public and to extent for policymakers, how do we create an impetus to change? We can't wait for a catastrophe of kind, nuclear accident, escalating tensions between nuclear states, et cetera, to trigger policy change. And my answer, I guess, is the report is a first step in that. But any final thoughts that you have on, on creating the impetus to change um, uh, that uh, we've been discussing today, Evo? So what's been fascinating uh, about the report, we've done a lot of public, you know, around the world, like, like uh, we're doing here, uh, conversations. Uh, we've also gone out and talked to, go to governments, particularly allied governments in the U.S. And uh, the, the allies uniformly have said, uh, it, is, it is high time we talk about this and you've provided us with a framework for doing that. I do think this is a government at, at its core a government function. Uh, and what we need to be able to do is to, high, you know, it, it's been so deep at the deputy assistant to the deputy assistant to the deputy assistant secretary somewhere you know, down in the bowels of these organizations. It really is a ministerial level conversation. Uh, and it is, you know, one of the things we, we argue is we should do more war gaming and crisis management at the political leadership level uh, to, to educate people about the importance. But at core, these are government-related issues, and that's where uh, I think the, uh, uh, the effort needs to be. And in this, the U.S. The US needs, to, needs to lead. My sense is that they're not willing to do it yet, uh, but the Allied demand is going up uh, in Europe and in Asia, and we need to find a strategy to respond to that at the governmental and the political governmental level, uh, because that's where uh, the energy then gets transferred to the rest of the bureaucracy. Well, this report is a very important first step in that effort. And Evo, congratulations on it. Uh, thank you for, for being willing to kind of share it with our, our community here. Special thanks to, to Corey and to Stephen and Amanda for joining us for this joint Chicago Council on Global Affairs Perth US Asia Center event. Uh, my apologies to those on the chat, uh, Oe, San, and others that I didn't get to your, your questions. Uh, but uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and we look forward to, to further research coming out of the Chicago Council and, and hope to partner again. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great to see Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers.